fellow songwriters, and welcome to the 16th episode of the How Songs Are Made podcast, where we talk to notable artists about their songwriting process. I'm your host, Trey Xavier, and today we're going to be talking to Tom England of Evergrey about how they write songs. Today's episode is sponsored by the amazing DistroKid and their awesome Splits feature. This is the DistroKid feature that I have used the most for sure. You can easily split all of the incoming money from any given track or album between yourself and unlimited collaborators. For example, if you and a friend collaborate on a track, you can set the split at 50-50 when you upload it, and then DistroKid is going to automatically split all of the incoming revenue, and he'll never have to worry if you're holding out on him. Your collaborators will need to make a DistroKid account, but they're going to get a 50% discount, so it's only 10 bucks. And as always, DistroKid never takes a cut. You and your collaborators get 100% of the earnings in total. Check the link in the description for 7% off your first year of DistroKid. So now, their new album dropped this past Friday. A Heartless Portrait, The Orphean Testament is Evergrey's 13th studio album. Please give a warm welcome to my guest, Tom England. Hello. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Heck yeah, dude. Um, So awesome to finally get you on. Um, I think the last time I saw you was on 70K, on the Mm -hmm. 70,000 Tons of Metal uh, I don't know. T- is it two years ago now? Th- maybe three? Oh, it must be more. It must be like four years. Four ago, years? Damn. At least. At least. Um, a thro- throwback to simpler times when we could do stuff like that. <laughs> yes. It's coming back. They're yeah. doing it again this year, but um, crazy. Um, yeah. Might be time for you to go uh, go back on. If it's been that long, you might. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I would love to go anywhere right love now. Love to so go anywhere. Like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so um awesome to see you again um i i've been spinning your new album quite a bit and i'm enjoying it a lot um crazy uh, just literally just dropped on friday um how are you feeling about it the release i mean as always relieved super stoked and super happy about the great feedback we've been getting so far it's uh i mean it's something that you never can take for granted at all and we we never do uh, but now it's not our album anymore. It's it's you guys' album. So uh, and I'm just eager to hear what people have to say about it. And a bit tired of speaking about myself, to be honest <laughs> to you. So, <laughs> which is a bad start on this end, interview. <laughs> no. I know what you good. mean, though. I know what you mean. Yeah. You know, you're like, I made this thing. And it, can't, it, it speaks for itself to an extent. But right. people want to know all this stuff about it. Um, I, I, although I suspect, I don't know, do you, have you talked much about the actual process of writing the songs with other, with other interviews? You can be honest. It, I won't feel. No, I mean, not, I'm not, I, yeah, I, I don't, maybe not that in depth, uh, just like the usual process, like very quickly because, you know, ordinary heavy metal magazine readers are more interested in, you know, the metal aspect, not the process that much, you know. So how much metal is it? And then <laughs> that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Did you put okay. in a lot of the metal? Because that's yeah, what we I, want. I would say I would <laughs> say so, yes. Probably most of the metal we ever, ever put into an album, I think. So no, I don't I say that all the time. So <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's what you gotta say every time. It has exactly. to be it's our most it's our heaviest and most melodic yet. And most atmospheric, heaviest, it, <laughs> best. And all that, great and it calls stuff. back to our early, earlier material, which you guys really like, um, but something fresh to it as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on this podcast, there's really only one question, and then everything else is a follow-up question to that question, and that is, what is the Evergrey songwriting process like, and was it the same this time around, or did you do anything different? I mean, having written and released. 13 Evergrey albums now, of course, they have, we, have, we have worked in many different ways, but for the last five albums, we have come to sort of uh, realize a working process that is working extremely well for us. Uh, and it starts with us doing our own demos by ourselves alone, uh, all the five of us. Uh, and we do that for a bunch of weeks, like maybe f- for this album, it's like four, four to six weeks. And then we met up and listened to the first initial ideas that we had. 
you also released an album like a year ago as well so so it's been a very hectic time for us but uh, since with the covid and all that we had more time on our hands right so yeah. we just wanted to take advantage of, of, of what we had for free uh so yeah so we we went into our studio started writing and we came back and met after like six weeks i think it was and we had 50 song ideas from the various members so we didn't struggle with any writing blocks or anything like that so we just but that's how we usually do it too and no matter how much material we have that's how we start and then we sort of start listening to everything and and try to figure out what everybody's feeling hot for you know uh, what, what is giving us a hard on basically yeah. you know so and that's that's what we want to concentrate on so so then we do that and then we're maybe down to 20 song ideas and then we go back and me and jonas the drummer usually starts to produce songs of the, out of these initial ideas that we have uh both in my studio and in his studio and by by ourselves so and then we have maybe yeah, like 20, 20 ideas that is more elaborate and more focused in a sense. And then we meet with the band again. And then, then we all, the five of us, discuss what we have done so far. And if we're still feeling great about a song or whatnot. So very de democratic uh, uh, way of working, in, in a sense. Even though we are two guys who's producing the, the songs. It's still, everybody has their say. And if one guy thinks it's this really sucks then he has to prove his point you know <laughs> uh -huh. if four other guys feels it's great you know and vice versa if one guy feels uh, a song is great but the rest of us don't feel that he has to make his case and that's actually happened on this album for a song called call out the dark where the keyboard mm -hmm. player Rickard had this keyboard intro and we were like yeah well yeah you know <laughs> not super super excited it sounds great but but then he really took uh, you know took advantage of, of of the power he has in the band and, and started to he met with Jonas on, on his own and sort of produced the idea that he heard in his head and then presented us presented it to us again okay. and then it was like aha mm. see so it's easy to dismiss ideas at uh, you know first time you hear them but at the same time that also gut feeling is also great uh, if you if I if I don't hear that I can do something great with something then it sort of dies already there, right? You know, if I, I'm thinking this as a verse, if somebody else says that, I'm just like, I don't hear myself singing over this at all. And we split everything five ways. So it's not, it's not about like any economic egos or anything like that. So it's just purely about what is the best song that we, the five of us can agree on. Long answer. Oh, it's, I hope it gets longer than that. You keep, <laughs> you just keep on going. Well, okay, here's, so, um, as you're producing these demos at home for the first wave of ideas, how fleshed out are they um, when you present them to the Pretty fleshed out. Pretty fleshed out. I mean, but, but it's also different. Uh, Henrik, uh, the guitar player, he, he presents his ideas as guitar's ideas only. He doesn't put any emphasis on the sound and, and uh, you know, whatever. He just, this is the riff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So either you get it or you don't, right? right. Uh, whereas me and Jonas, we really produce it. It sounds not very far from what you will hear on the album. So, uh, and uh, Ricard obviously does all of his stuff more keyboard based, uh, as he's the keyboard player. And Johan, the bass player, he, he does drums, bass, and guitars. So, but pretty fleshed out. You know, uh, we don't want to write the full song on our own, but we still at the same time want to sort of convey this is what we see or hear or feel and want to make you understand and feel that way too you know so yeah so you're uh, do you like uh like will you program drums and put some bass parts on it and stuff like that yeah so everything like, and some yeah. some parts even have uh for this album we even wrote when we did when we had decided on the 10 songs we 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 wanted to go with or 11 or whatever it was we immediately started recording as we were writing and finishing the songs. So everything you hear is what was written in the moment, but we also decided that we would do it perfectly, make sure the guitar is in damn tune, you know, yeah. <laughs> because I've done that so many times. Uh -huh. This is fantastic. Too bad the guitar is out of tune. You know, it's like, <laughs> so you have to re-record it, relearn the whole process and all that. So 
when it was time for the drums and bass to to start uh, when we had to start recording the drum and bass they already had finished tracks for vocals guitars and solos and keyboards oh, and wow. everything so they recorded onto us basically uh so yeah very fleshed out very yeah so do you guys get together and uh play them as a band at all or are you you're com you're writing and recording and you never jam them out beforehand. No, not some riffs uh, we do. For this album, we didn't uh, at all. Uh, some riffs, you know, you write on tour and, and then ah, listen to it and you can do it on sound check. But it's mm -hmm. a very inconvenient, inconvenient way of yeah. writing for, for me personally. You know, I've so, never understood how people could do that. That's crazy to me. <laughs> no, it's like, that's amazing. I would need a whole bus by myself yeah. sitting and, you know, close that door and leave me alone <laughs> and all that stuff. I've only been on, tour, <laughs> I've only been on proper tour one time. But it's like you can't do you can't do anything. You can barely like like it's enough work just getting dinner and like coffee. Like forget yeah. like writing and jamming. But yeah, 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 sure. But I mean, you you get used to it and you find your ways. And I mean, some people are extremely talented doing that. Like Ed Sheeran, for instance. He he did all of his albums on tour. <laughs> so it's hard wow, to blame I... him, right? So yeah. He's probably he got a much bigger. He's got. He has what you just described, though. He has his yes. own bus. He can do that. It's him, it's him and know? the producer, and he goes straight from the concert into the back lounge of the bus and yeah. starts recording. Wow, good for him. <laughs> that's uh, that's, uh, a, that's yeah. A big where were move. we? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, uh, okay. So, one. Let's see. Um, what is it like? to sort of as you're narrowing these ideas down and you're sort of like you like you're saying you have to sort of sell it to the to the rest of the band a little bit um is it like is it ever nerve-wracking are you ever like oh man i wrote this and i don't know if the guys are gonna like it yeah and i mean and i want to make sure that we get this straight that it's not me selling it to them it's also them selling it to me yeah, yeah, yeah. and vice versa yeah <clears throat> excuse me so yes because music for me is everything. It's the most important thing there is, you know? So it's not something that I take lightly at all. It's uh, something that I put my heart and soul into. And the five of us all do that. So for, yeah, it's extremely, it's a sensitive thing too, you know? <laughs> but we have come to the point where we, where we need to be blunt about things. It's like, this is not, you know, cutting it for me. I'm not feeling anything. And uh, now today we know that it's not, we're not saying shit just to make somebody, you know, feel bad or, you know, cutting their songs or whatever it is. It's it's purely about those songs that we, the five of us, feel the strongest about. That's cool. It, it, <coughs> I always say that, like, you're your own first audience, uh, you know, when you're writing a song. Um, if you're writing with other people, then your second audience is the rest of the band. And yeah. Um, it sounds like you have to, you know, you guys are sort of, like I said, like selling them to each other, or like, you know, presenting them to each other, like, oh, I hope you, so you all have to like, really like it first and then eventually presenting it to other people. So that's, that's a, that's a, a kind of a cooler multi-step process, like a vetting process for these songs. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean. Honestly, that's where the real production is happening. The song, produc song production is happening there and then in our headquarters. And then we go back again and we do this back and forth a bunch of times until we have the finished result more or less. And then I can go back and start writing the vocal top line for what, whatever we have. And Henry can go back and write his parts of his solos and everybody can work on their individual instrument to perfect the songs that we have decided that we want to write, right? So. And now, now that we we are also set on the idea that we record bass and drums together live on top of the tracks that are already finished, that makes so much more sense, you know? Because if I can make my vocals, which is the first thing that the audience will hear and react to often, uh, and I, if I have the room to do that without fucking up somebody's drum roll or whatever it might be, you know? Yeah. Then there, there will be enough space for everyone and everybody knows that oh damn here's a great place where i can put the emphasis on whatever you want to do you know yeah and uh but that's those things were sort of totally lost in the beginning of our career where and i guess in in most people's careers uh, where we record the vocals last drums first you know it's like why today you can record in any order you want make it make the song happen right so yeah so we learned about 
we learned a lot during the years. I mean, it's we released albums for 25 years. So it would suck if we didn't get better at it, right? So, <laughs> so and, and nothing else, you don't want to be getting worse. But, sure. Yeah, you right, learn. Right. It's yeah, it's a constant learning process. Um, so when you're um, when you're writing the songs, the, your song uh, ideas to start, generally, how does it start? Does it start with a guitar riff? Does it start with a lyric idea? It's so different for me. Usually, I take a morning walk. Like I live out on the west coast of Sweden, far away from people. I hardly meet anyone ever, so I can walk for six months without meeting anyone during the winter half of the year. Uh, and that's when my sort of thought process is being fueled by being alone, in a sense, right? So I can walk there, and then all of a sudden I get like a like a line of a lyric, and then that lyric line sort of starts painting a world for me that I you know, that I want to put into musical notes, if that makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so that's usually how it works. It's, it's a line or it's, it's a, like a rhythm or you wake up in the middle of the night, like every other musician in the world, like, I can't sleep, but I have this drum beat in my head, you know? <laughs> it's like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, and I use my iPhone and I sing in all of my ideas while I walk. And sometimes you get home and, and, and you, and you start listening back to the, all of these ideas. And it's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you don't understand anything. It doesn't make any sense. What's I was like, do, 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 It's like, what? Yeah, whatever. So it's a lot of those things. I think I got like 1,000 ideas on there that I don't know what it is, you know? <laughs> I'm always telling people, you got to be receptive all the time to this kind of thing. And you got to get it all down as while it's fresh. Because even though so much of it, like, I, I don't know about what percentage of ideas you put down that are good. Mine's like at least 50% trash. But, th you know, and then there's 50% that are like pretty good, 30% that are like maybe usable. And then you get the yeah. one that's fucking magic. And if you hadn't uh, in your phone, it would have been lost. Um, yeah, and that's also the thing. Sorry. but uh, No, go ahead. The, the, I mean, one of the key elements of songwriting and the biggest lessons that I've learned is that you, there is music that you will, will have to write that will never end up anywhere in order to get to the songs that you were just describing that will end up on an album or sold to some other artist or whatever. But so that's before, before I was extremely worried about, oh, I put eight hours into this riff. What the hell does that matter if it sucks, you know? <laughs> get it out of your system and move on to the next thing so that's the biggest lesson for me to understand that there is music that you have to write in order to get to the good stuff you know it's like a cleansing thing right so but the other thing is also going to work get up get off your ass go to work every day start writing don't sit and wait for inspiration inspiration will come when you work hopefully you know and uh, because some people need to feel sad or happy or i don't know you will feel what the music will tell you to feel, I think, in a sense, too, right? So it works both ways. So, But if you sit down and you make up your mind that today I'm at least going to write one riff or one melody or one sentence, that usually leads to three, four, five ideas. or, And then you might have one that you're happy with at the end of the day. So let's talk a little bit about where it goes once you've got one of these little snippets of an idea and now it's time to go to work you've got or let you've got tons of them you pick one out that you're like really feeling right Wh how do you generally go about developing it like like give us a um maybe use an example from the album i really like the the i guess it's the title track the orphean testament um mm. uh maybe tell us a bit about how that came into into being from a nugget of an idea and that was was actually i think uh let me think what i need to figure out what song it is first <laughs> in my head but yeah that that came because you probably have some working title that's like yeah. like heavy yeah. riff in number B. four <laughs> number four yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and i have 900 number four in the computer so when you search for them it's like what the hell but yeah but that actual guitar riff that you hear there now is based on a guitar riff that the drummer Jonas wrote. And I was like, there is something here in this guitar riff that is fantastic, but at the same time, we could sort of, we need to do something with it to make it groove more. 
And I don't, you know, and that's as and as long as you're open to having other people coming in and producing your stuff, then 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 uh, there's a possibility to make better music, right? So mm -hmm. that's how it started. Uh, and then I really can't remember that much from that song in particular because it was okay. based on his, and I just helped him in my way perfect the the guitar part of, of that song. But for the song "Blindfolded," which was written on this on this guitar, it was based on the tuning, which was really weird, right? So this is a drop G tuning. Okay. And that's how I wrote that riff. So that was totally based on the tuning. I know you can't hear it, but it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, so and, okay. and and then that whole song came straight out of having a guitar that is tuned in a new way. So this is a seven string guitar, that was super nerdy stuff, but that we have usually tuned in A, but we dropped the last lowest string to G, which is uh -huh. super, super heavy, right? And then all of a sudden, some part of my brain woke up and said, ah, I never heard this part before, you know? And that's how that song started, right? And then it pretty much writes itself. So what um, do you generally like write some music parts and then lay a melody on top of it? Or do you ever like sort of write the melody and then put drop some chords underneath it to fill it out a bit? Good question. No, I always write a, a vocal melody or whatever melody I want, if it's a keyboard melody, on top of something else. So it's not like I start with, I don't have a vocal line and then I write music around it. That usually, I don't think that ever happened in Evergreen. Uh, for other music and stuff, it did. But for Evergreen, no, it's usually based on some, you know, chord prog progression. And then I start to hum, <laughs> sound like an idiot into this phone. And then I come home and it's like, and you can only record, you know, your voice also. So I have to say that this is based on melody number four. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's it's so stupid, but uh, it works for me. It's a lovely process that I really also appreciate being able to do because I figured it out now. Uh, so, so I start humming and then this hums turn in my brain turns into words. So when it's time to write lyrics out of them, I sort of hum them in a way that sounds like words, right? So you know the need to be on. What the hell word is that? You know, and then you know <laughs> the you have to find out what the song is about. <laughs> well, exactly. There's a lot of birds in there, right? Goddamn. <laughs> a genuine yeah, but that's sweet dude. That's how it works. Chef. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So you're you're kind of uh, improvising gibberish. And then yes. the words kind of come. Okay. Now, and the words don't come until when I sit down and write the last part of the vocal melodies. Then I write the words. But then for me, already this gibberish, the Swedish chef gibberish, sounds like words in my head, at least, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I should maybe, should, maybe I should release those ideas <laughs> on albums. This is the <laughs> without any lyrics. That would the be Orphean awesome. Testament Swedish chef yeah. version. With <laughs> yeah, right. I would pay good fucking money to hear that. Good <laughs> ass money. I think. Sign oh, me up. <laughs> there will be, have, have to be a lot of money for me to yeah, give that, that out. <laughs> well, you know, but people, I, I know tons of people who are held back greatly by not wanting to feel stupid. Be and they won't even by themselves in their bedroom won't do that kind of thing and and people don't understand yeah. how important it is to just to completely lose all uh like uh whatever the word is you know like don't feel weird about it you gotta just shit it out of your mouth and it's gonna yeah. suck at first and then it gets better it it, it comes into form a after a while and um like you said you've been doing it for so long you don't feel weird about you know mouth jamming into your phone on a walk in the swedish wilderness somewhere um well i mean i do when i get home it's like what the hell is this and if what if somebody saw me and you know whatever but it doesn't matter because that's where the magic happens i think in, in music making it happens when you can't explain it where does it come from i don't have a clue i don't have a clue 
it comes from my brain, I hope. <laughs> you hope. <laughs> or I'm being sort of abducted and somebody plants uh, vocal and uh, melodies into my head every yeah. night, you know. And then, you ha- <laughs> then you've been crediting the songwriting all wrong. There's somebody else that should be <laughs> getting exactly. royalties. Yeah, might have a problem soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody's going to show up in a little spaceship and be like, bro, did you write? Dude, you didn't, my goddamn you didn't money. put me on ASCAP? Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Yeah. lawsuit um yes. but um so let's see okay so you're always top lining on something that you've already got uh th- that leads me to a question at, as a band with some pretty technical guitar stuff does it get to be a problem when you've written something and you, like you have to play it and sing it at the same time yes all the time <laughs> but at the same time at the same time, that's also one of those things that you can't think of beforehand, right? While being in this composing process, you need to be inspired by everything and not think about anything that will hinder you, right? So, and that, just like you said, don't be afraid, look like an idiot, don't look, don't look in the mirror while doing the vocal melodies, for God's sake, I mean... <laughs> You will look like a jerk, right? You probably are, are a jerk. Yeah, but you know. So make it easy on yourself. <laughs> Turn off the lights if you need, you know. But uh, <laughs> you need to sort of let go of everything in order for the great stuff to come. At least that's how I've perceived it throughout the years. Yeah. Not saying yeah. that I've written any great stuff, but according to myself. But yeah. So you're, but you're never considering the live performance aspect of it as you're writing you don't go oh i can't do that i'm I'm not even gonna you, you're no. like i'll just i'll do the bon jovi and put the guitar behind me and let henrik play the riff and i, I do sing. i do that live now <laughs> which is great for the songs where i can't figure it out mm-hmm. it's still gonna be most important to present the song in the way that it will sound great live right it would i mean it would suck if i started playing his stuff and it would suck because i can't play it right then it's more makes more sense for me to sing it only. And there are songs that I that are too complicated for me to sing, but it also added a dynamic live where I do let go over the guitar and just sing. And then I come in on the chorus or the bridge or whatever it might be. And that gives another push like it does on an album. Basically, you raise the you know volume for for DBs and you know, when everything kicks in. So I'm the kick in guy, the kick in guy. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so do you guys, uh, work with a producer at any point, uh, like an outside producer, um, at any point during the process, once you've got it, the songs kind of where you want them? Now we did no, I mean, as far as song production, you mean then, I mean, uh, yeah, as some, far as sound engineering, we, we work no, no, with no, Jacob the, Hansen. Ah, no, yeah. I mean the, I mean the writing and, and, uh, yeah process part of it it's, you guys are completely doing it all all uh, just you guys producing it yeah but then we also have like our go-to friends that i think we we we, we sort of trust that we, I, I have a bunch of them vikram uh shankar which is my um, duo guy in my other band silent skies i go to him a lot and ask him what do you think about this and i have a another friend called simone molarone who's a guitar player in in a band called dgm i ask him a lot and then I asked my daughter a lot about the vocal melodies, if she, what she digs and if it sounds too boomer or, or if it's, a, <laughs> you know, you sound like does, an old man. Does huh? it slap? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All of those questions. But, and, and then, of course, back and forth with each other as well. But sometimes it, it's more valuable to have somebody on the outside that you really trust uh, and you really trust uh, that person's musicianship and skills and know-how that you can ask that will tell you that dude mm, sometimes they even say i would even change that note to this note and that, oh wow that's what i was going for you know <laughs> so yeah i mean there's a lot of credit to go to to especially these two guys for me uh, that i mentioned so but yeah do you have anyone like that who is not a musician do you ask any like normies well, my wife is not my my wife is just um, sort of she just likes music. Uh, she's not uh, particularly talented <laughs> singing or anything like that, and, and she knows uh, all her other feelings. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Well, and then <laughs> when I'm playing stuff tonight. to her, yeah, she, yeah, 
it's the couch for this week, I think. But yeah, but I mean, when I ask her, I ask her as because she's representing like 80% of the audience, right? That that don't care about all these fucking nerdy stuff and what chord is this? She cares about what it brings her. You know, what do I feel when I listen to this song? And sometimes she's like, "Well, that was great." I was like, "Cut that song." And then, so uh, and she, uh, this is funny because the the blindfolded, which was the last video we did for this album, mm -hmm. that was chosen by the young people at Napalm Records, and my wife, who's pretty young, and my daughter, who's also very young. So so all of these young kids, I said, "This is by far the best song," and we in the band were like, "What the hell is this?" We didn't feel anything remotely close to what they were feeling for this song outside of being super happy with it but you know so it was so we let them decide the and the label was yeah let's go with the let's go with the kids <laughs> <laughs> it's a smart choice they're uh yeah. they they might not have as much money as the older guys but they'll uh get they get the money from their parents and then they right. vote with that you know what i mean so uh that's cool so you ha it's almost like it's a, a little test audience a little uh, focus group yeah, and I think that's if if you if you can allow yourself to do that with your music because it's I mean it's a very personal thing to be a music writer. Uh, of course, everybody knows that who is writing music. It's so naked. It's so sort of what's the word? You put yourself out there so much. At least I feel that I do. Uh, so that when you give it to somebody else to judge what you spent five months on, and they're gonna judge it in the next thirty seconds, right? That's what's gonna happen right now. And they're like. I don't know, do I go fuck yourself? You know, it's like you just want to <laughs> sometimes punch them in the face. But no, that's when you sort of have to understand that, yeah, maybe you're wrong or maybe it's not uh, the, the right idea or whatever. Maybe this song wasn't for them. That can also be the case, right? So it's a balance of all of these things to make make, make an album that you're that we're that we are super happy with. And that's the that's the only thing we're interested in, in a sense, first. And, and then we, you know, when we have done everything that we feel that we can do in order to make sure that we are right about our own ideas, then then it's time to let it go. So by the time it reaches the stores and like now, like Monday after release, it's 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 for us, it's been a done project for for such a long time already. You know, so. that's yeah, that's hard. You've done it. Uh, you've recorded it. How many how long ago at this point? And and. By this po by this time, I'm sure you've gone through the whole cycle of being excited about it and then getting sick of it and hating it and then eventually coming back around to liking it again. I don't know. Where are you at with that right now? Yeah, that's why you also sound pretty obnoxious when you don't know what song it is because I don't want to I don't want to listen to them. You know, when I when I when we finished the production, which we did in like whatever when when was that? Probably like December, January, December actually before Christmas. Uh, then I don't want to listen to it like eight times a week up until now because then I'm doing interviews and talking about stuff. I want to feel excited about them. So I start listening to them pretty much like a week before starting the promotion. So I know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. But sometimes I don't know what the song is. Oh, which song is that? And it's not because I'm super, I'm, I'm not trying to be obnoxious. I'm just, I'm, I'm not that interested in the music anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the hell? I'm honestly you're, I'm on to the next thing. On I'm on to the next, to the next album. album. Yes. Yeah, you're already let's, damn sure. uh, let's do an interview about that. We'll interview yeah. about the album. It's going out. great. It's going great? <laughs> great. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh so Oh, what was I gonna ask? Oh, I, it went right out of my brain. Okay, so do you um is there anything that you did on on this one? that is completely different from any other album that you've done before something that you didn't do before or maybe even something small yes something big actually we you know since it wasn't the start of the in the midst of this pandemic period we also felt like we lost touch with our fans you know like every other band felt as well i guess you know you're not touring you're not get, getting that immediate feedback from anyone that you need and love you know so so what we did was, and it was based on the fact that I was recording my ideas on my iPhone. And one day I was, this sounds pretty good, you know. This probably could work, you know. Uh, if I have all of our audience send in their 
uh, contributions to the song Save Us, singing Save Us, then we'll put them on the album. And that's what we did. So I, th- I don't know how many hundreds of, of them we put on the album, but they're on there and their names are all in the booklet as the background singers. And, and that was a way for us to sort of con- reconnect with our fans and say, hey, do you remember us? Uh, you want to do this? Uh, so that's that's one thing that we did, which is on there, which is super cool. It sounds super massive and uh, very unique in a, in a sense to do that. I feel too. And then we also have a song called "Midwinter Calls" because in the midst of the pandemic, all of a sudden Sweden opened up again, and we got to play like three shows. So that's when we were recording the album as well. So then we took advantage of that and recorded live audience in Gothenburg, our hometown, hometown. And uh, so they are on the song Midwinter Calls, singing a song they never heard, uh, just singing to a melody that we played before. And then we stopped playing it and they sang and then we did repeated that a bunch of times, back and forth. Wow. Both in Gothenburg and Stockholm. So they are on the album as well. So we have a live audience on a studio album, which is super cool. <laughs> that is cool. That's a gr- that. Wow. That is such an interesting uh, way to do that. I heard. Yeah. Uh. Off the dome, I can think of one other time I've heard of something like that. Joe Satriani did a thing um, where he got a bunch of people in a room and he would play a lick and then have them sing it back, and they got like progressively more and more complicated. So oh, it's cool. like it got. Um, I don't remember what the song is called, but that's uh, that's a great opportunity. Wait, to just jump on that. So you'd already written the song, and then you were like, "Hey, we might as well get the audience in on that." Wow. Yeah, we've written this song and this, this, there's this vocal part, oh, 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 you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, this needs to be sung by like a hockey audience, you know, yeah. so, and wait a minute, we're playing a show like in two weeks, let's record them. So that's what we did. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. And it's also awesome for them to have something great to sort of remember from this dark time period, right? So, yeah. At least we had an album that we sort of released. <laughs> yeah, it's something to show for yourself. Um, okay, so uh, any other things that you that you did in in the process of of writing the songs that you hadn't done before? Anything unusual? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's unusual, but it is that fact that I said before that we 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 made sure that when we had an idea that we were set on that we recorded it then and there so so that johan and jonas the drummer and bass could have full freedom to do whatever they want without interfering with any of the other instruments you know which is a and then they controlled themselves in the studio they had this laptop controlling a big ass ssl desk but they were sitting and doing it themselves no engineers so they played through the songs like five times and it's like should we record it and then they recorded it, you know, so and so what you hear is the live takes of that. And if there was something that was fucked up or whatever, they re-recorded only that part, you know. So but yeah. all of all of their stuff is recorded together in the same room. So wow. Cool. So yeah. the damn that gives it a, a different feel, doesn't it? It's it's bands are always talking about wanting to capture the live feel in the studio. Yeah. Uh it's pretty brave these days i mean you just have to know your shit you have to sure be you have to be on your really on your game to do it um yeah, yeah. but if you can it it i think it gives it a certain special edge and also i mean especially since we i mean the guitar players and the keyboards and the vocals and all of that is recorded onto uh drum machines and program drums and and whatever uh so we just recorded to click and whatever we had right Mm -hmm. but nowadays we 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 have been doing this for such a long time so we know how to groove to a to a program drum and also our drums are not programmed like super stiff either you know yeah it's programmed by the drummer so it sounds like it's not it's no different right yeah so but that also yeah so when they came in and gave that extra live feel to this sort of more strict recording that is what gave the album, you know, its sound and what's make it stand out. And I, yeah, I must say, I'm super, super proud of this album. So I think you should be. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I am. <laughs> so you, you so you're you're tracking the the parts for real as you're sort of coming up with them. That's a lot of commit. Yes. You're committing yeah. to the to the 
to the thing as as it's fresh in your mind. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I, I think o- about what you said in the beginning of the interview that I'm going to be sort of analyzing my own thoughts about my thought process and my working process a lot. And I'm doing that right now. And I understand that for some people, this sounds totally bonkers, right? That how can you do that and m- be sure that this is what's going to end up on the album, right? But I think that's what sort of all of these years of music writing and writing for a specific band also for 25 years, that also gives you sort of that backbone. And somebody asked me, when do you know a song? When do you know that a song is done, right? And it's like a conversation. It's like a conversation. I write something, the song tells me you have to do this, talks back to me basically. And then I try to, you know, perfect something or change that. And when the song is silent and don't talk back to me, that's when I know that it's done, right? So it's a conversation that it's gone silent. And then we have a sort of mutual agreement that this is it. This is, this is it. Yeah. That's the most, that's the most perfect thing that anybody's ever said on this fucking podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you only had 16 episodes. It's okay. (laughs) Oh, that just hit me like a ton of fucking bricks, dude. When the conversation goes silent, Deanna, clip that shit. <laughs> That's my there my producer. Uh, hot damn, dude! Wow. Thank Ooh. you. Yeah. Ooh-hoo. That's why I do this, dude. That kind of shit right there. Awesome. Um, man. Uh, let's let's go to some audience questions because I don't do this. Um, I have not done this yet, but I wanted to see what the um you know, what the viewers wanted to know. So I'm, I'm going to grab a couple questions out of the chat here. Let's see. What's a Great. good one? Um, Jesse Parrish wants to know if you guys are going to tour the USA soon. Oh, my God. I hope so. I, I was, I'm sort of starving for being at a Wendy's, you know. <laughs> so <it's> like... <laughs> oh, man. No, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, we've done a fair amount of touring in, the, in America and in North America. So... Yes, as soon as possible. It's not making it easier now that the, the visa stuff is getting more and more complicated. But what our plan is to do, because we're doing this like four day show tour in Europe in the fall, uh, and then we have to come back to the US in, I, I hope, February, March, looking into different options. But the, of course, yes. Awesome. Um... Let's see. John Toth wants to know, uh, can you speak about your new signature comparison guitar coming out? Any specs that you can divulge? <laughs> I mean, it's going to be based uh, on a guitar which is called Dellinger Prominence because that's mm-hmm. also why I've been working with comparison for 20 years this year or next year or whatever. So I'm loving the guitars. You know, that that's the thing. I don't want to change too much of the guitar other than sort of color and some features on the neck and some placements for a volume knob but i don't want to i don't want to exchange like let's take away all of the comparison mics and put simmer duncan so demarge so in, in them because i don't because i'm happy with this right mm-hmm. that's why i play the guitar the, right. and uh so we're working on the details i want to make sure that we get get a guitar that is slightly different to make it sort of represent me but at the same time, I'm also representing comparison guitars. And I really, again, love the guitars. And I've been using them for every recording for, for the last 20 years. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't want to change anything, really, you know? Yeah, you're probably very comfortable with the way they've been and you're so used to it. So it's, you know, put your exactly. name on it and call it a day. Well, that's and cool. And they sound, they sound in a certain way and they feel in a certain way. And that has sort of become... How shall I put it? You know, there's like a muscle memory <laughs> when mm-hmm. you play guitar. You you know stuff because your muscle remembers them. But there's also like a sound memory, and uh, and when you, when when I hear a note of a git of a guitar, this sounds so nerdy and weird, but it's the truth. I couldn't I couldn't work with another guitar company because I've been working with this company for such a long time that this is my sound. You know, so I, even if uh, Gibson came and say, "Yeah, well, we will give you the next Les Paul, and you can do whatever the whatever you want with it." I was like, "Well, can I just bring my my <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like an old. Yeah, I'm super happy. I'm super stoked. I think it's, but it's gonna be a while. Probably, 
if we can have it ready for this time next year to have all the details in place, that that would be awesome. That's that's our aim. Great. Looking forward to that too. Let's see. Jack, Me too. <laughs> uh, Jack Guitars wonders what song you are most proud of at the moment and why. Is it from all of the, all of all of the songs? Uh, I would from say the from album? the new album. Okay, uh, from the new album, I think one of the songs that has sort of. I think it's a it's, it's a song called Ominous, and I don't know why, but it's also because of this new down tuned element, and we also use this neural plugin the gujira stuff where you can add a lower octave on the lowest fucking drop oh, yeah. g tuning yeah. so it's like doesn't make any sense but it's like <laughs> something is happening there you know in the, in the depth of the guitar sound so yeah that really hits me hard uh i think that's on this album that's the song that i'm most proud of uh absolutely and uh, it's also probably featuring one of my best guitar solos that i ever played and written and recorded so awesome uh carter estill had a question that i actually was thinking about as well and he says tom why did you choose wildfire to close the record um it's a, it's a it's a very bold choice for something that's so, um so stark i thought yeah yeah yeah, for I mean, for us it was uh, was wasn't me choosing it actually. It was key, keyboard player Rickard. It's his fault. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I also made made it a lot of sense because it's a quite intense album all the way through, and then you get to this tenth song that sort of gives you a breather and sort of what the hell was I just listening to for the first forty five minutes of this album, and then you can hit play again. But I mean, it's I think it's a lovely ending to a. To, to it gives you five minutes of contemplation of your experience with the with the album at least that's how i would love for people to experience the album listening to it from song one to song 10. i know that's not gonna happen but yeah <laughs> uh, i mean i think that even in a world of singles this kind of music lends itself to album listening um i think yeah there's a lot know, of people that are listening to it that way yeah sure um, so I think that, uh, I think that actually kind of encourages it because you get to the end and you go like, wow, this is a very profound, like deep, stark moment. And it's, it's, it's a nice downer and not a downer, like a, like a bummer, but it's like a, it, you know, it brings the mood to a certain introspective place. And then you go like, yeah. all right, fuck, I got to bring it back up. Let's run, let's run that back again. <laughs> let's go yeah, the whole you thing. Know, exactly. And it's like, for me, it's like, it's that last chord of a show, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it's like, second, thank you, good night. And we're out and people are feeling a bit sad about it. And we, we are too. And, but on a CD, you can hit play again. So it's, uh, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> um, let's see, we got a good one. Uh, where was it? Okay. Uh, ooh, I'm going to butcher this name. Also Lustosa <laughs> uh, wants to know, where does the greatest inspiration for your lyrics come from, from the happiest or saddest moments? <laughs> well, if you listen to Evergrey uh, at all, <laughs> you would think that you would know that uh, it's from the saddest moments. But with that said, before I wrote from a perspective of desperation and sadness more, and I today I write about the same subjects, but from a from a position of strength and self confidence, and uh, you know more in the way that I now today know what what life did to me to bring me to be the person I am today, and I'm 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 a I'm in a good place today, and and uh, I wouldn't want to be without what I've been through, you know. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm curious to know on that same note a little bit of the meaning behind both the title of the album and the lyrics on the title track um because it, it felt like a very pointed title to the point where it you you had to have two titles like it was this yeah. th um the orphean testament must be very important for you to have it be like whoop almost like a hyphenated last name, you know? <laughs> so right, so right. I'm, I'm curious to know the meaning behind that whole thing. If you can give us a little bit. Sure. I mean, the, the first part of the title, the a heartless portrait part is about 
I mean, I've been writing about myself for the last 25 years, right? So it's about me writing about myself in a rather ruthless way sometimes uh, that I don't think about when writing it, but that I might think about after the fact or when I'm listening to a song like five years later, I, I, I understand that I was telling myself something at this point in life. And so, but nothing more than that. But then, then we also wanted to have this idea of Orpheus, you know, who, who had had the chance to save his loved one from the flames of hell, if he just would have looked straight forward, right? And uh, but he couldn't stop himself. <laughs> He just had to turn his head, right? And I always thought that was one of the cruelest Greek mythologies. I mean, the Greek mythology is cruel as shit, but that one stuck me so bad. Yeah, and for me, for me, it's like, dude, you you fucking suck <laughs> for doing that, right? So he was like an egotistic bastard in my in in mm -hmm. my sort of. So, but I mean, what does what that does in the title sense is is that it's sort of pointing at the shortcomings of humanity right and especially about my own so it's it's yeah it's about that it's and then of course he went around playing sad music for the gods so they cried pretty much we play sad music and people cry but in essence it, it wasn't i mean other than what i just said in the beginning it didn't have that much depth but uh yeah i mean that's deep what how how deep you want to go that was very deep <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty deep but i mean it, it's it's uh, yeah it's about it's about how we are searching for fast solutions they, a lot of the album today is about how we how we are chasing something that we don't even know what it is right uh if people say go left we go left and we don't know why we're going left right and for kids today or for younger people or for people that are less fortunate and can't even you know afford to go to a university and educate yourself and uh, so you can sort of learn to criticize media and where you get your information and how twitter and facebook and instagram rules our worlds and we don't know why you know we ju we just know that we're gonna buy this damn thing and we don't know how we don't have a clue why you know and uh, i think that's i think that's uh i think that's sad and i think that's something that i'm also contributing to as a musician as you know i make my livelihood on selling myself on all these medias that i just mentioned right but that's why i want to urge people to make sure that you know who you are find out who you are before someone tells you who to be right uh, and uh, i understand that that's extremely hard and very easy to say when you're my age but as long as you have so some sort of thought in the back of your head that ah I wanna might wanna check myself or check what I where I get the information or because people today don't kids today don't look up to fucking politicians right they look up to who looks coolest on Instagram right or whatever TikTok whatever it is today right so if yeah. we would urge all the Justin Bieber fans to go and end the war in Russia he would have fucking one billion girls going in there and fucking slaying right and <laughs> that would be that <laughs> Done. Justin Two Bieber's days. army of girls the yeah. next uh world power for <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but I mean it is a world power I mean he I has such BT, a, the, the BTS power. army did something like like that crashed some uh some internet uh polls and i don't remember what it was but they, i think you make a great point which is that as artists and musicians we have people's attention and it's there's something that we should be saying when we've got it you know like hey like you know you're listening to the song you're you're thinking about the person who made it um like you're gonna listen to what they have to say that's what that's kind of the point um so i mean yeah sure and i mean i think i mean i i'm not gonna sort of be lecturing people with my lyrics ever but if you want to listen there is something there that i have put and spent time on you know that i want to say that is important for me at least and if you if you want to dig into that i will i can probably promise you that it will add another perspective onto your music listening because when i discovered that myself when i started listening to lyrics of like pink floyd or europe even you know what is he saying here why is he so sad you know that adds an element of of quality to it's like then that gives it that movie feature for me you know it, it, it makes it uh uh like a 
flick before my inner eye, in a sense, right? Yeah. So, on, on a sort of similar note, um, talking about how, um, yeah, being told who you are, you know, by someone, there's also an element of where influence is extremely important. And somebody uh, had asked about the influences of the of of the band, but I'm mostly curious to know about influences maybe that you um, picked up during this time or anything that you were listening to that had some kind of impact on the songs for this album or or even just stuff that you were enjoying listening to at the time. Yeah. Here comes a really boring answer, unfortunately, because the only time I listen to music is when I travel or when I'm on tour or because if I'm not traveling, I'm in here doing, making music, right? And then by the end of the day, I'm fed up with music mm -hmm. and I don't want to listen. And then I get inspired if I hear music in a, in a movie or whatever, you know? So for me, I think it's rather I've been inspired by other stuff that I've been involved with, right? And that sounds so ego-centered in a sense, but it, it's the truth, right? So I've had, the, I have this other band called Silent Skies where it's me and Vikram Shankar and we, it's sort of, atmospheric movie score music with vocals, right? Mm -hmm. And me and him also write music for video games. Like we've done uh, music for like the Evil Dead game now and, and uh, all, all of that stuff. So that also inspired that. And all of these things inspire each other, right? So all of a sudden I found myself singing with a, like a falsetto voice on the Evergrey album. You will hear it in Save Us, for instance. Uh, and that comes from me singing like that in Silent Skies, right? And elements in Silent Skies gets a lot of elements that we put into all of these. World War Z game we also did. And oh, yeah, we done, I mean, we, I think we've done like four or five games this this year, this last year. So, wow. It's, uh, but not, not only us. We're working with a super huge team. But uh, yeah, we contributed a lot to, to, to these games. Yes. That's amazing. I did not know that at all. Yeah. Damn, that's something that I would like love to get into. That sounds like so much fun. Um, do you, so actually, I'm a little curious because you brought up um, your falsetto and s singing in certain styles and stuff. I've always loved your, you have this, hmm, I'm going to call it a, like a looseness, like a, this sort of, a very particular inflection and rhythmic way that you sing that, um, is very very comfortable feeling it's compared to other metal singers that i've heard who tend to be very very pre precise have this sort of like very on the beat um almost grid like um rhythmic quality you have this laid back a little bit of a bluesy kind of a sound um mm. i don't i don't really know how else to describe it um yeah. does that come from anywhere in particular uh of singers you've listened to or 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 anything like that or is that just that just come i mean you? dude <laughs> yeah I, I get the question but i don't know i mean it's like for me too i mean i listen to mark Knopfler of dire straits i'm not sounding like him that much but right. you know <laughs> but yeah. he was one of the first thing that led me to start playing guitar and singing and all that and same with david gilmore for pink floyd but also you know bruce dickinson from iron maiden and, and joey tempest mm -hmm. from europe and Glenn Benton from D side and uh, you know all all yeah. of, so it's, I don't have I don't know okay there wasn't any, I think that, anybody that maybe that you were emulating early on that that came out of it's no. just it's just you. no I figured out I couldn't emulate anyone I think that's the <laughs> it was like we want to play the like dream theater and it's like we can't do that obviously you know so fuck that let's do something else I want to <laughs> sing like Klaus Mine in Scorpions I can't do that let's do something else you know that works so. But again, that's that's where we're back to find yourself, right? And I found very early that I couldn't sound like anybody else, which was a blessing for me. It is a blessing for me now, right? So, uh, I because don't know. if you're searching for your inner voice, if, if you're searching for your identity as a musician, that's something that I remember said in the first review I read about Evergrey. They have their own sound. It might have been shit, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but I took it as a compliment. <laughs> well, it's you, you want two things. You want a really unique sound and you want it to be good. 
yeah. <laughs> luckily you you do have that but that's you know you've developed that a lot um yeah. and i think it's it's funny to hear that that you were kind of like oh man i wish i could sing like x singer or whatever and now there's all these people including myself who wish they could sing like you <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's so like, it's so weird that's crazy right um, I mean, I didn't even refer to myself as a singer up until the fifth album. Yeah. It's like, I play guitar and everything. Oh, yeah, and I sing too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm the, uh, it's actually me who's the singer too, yes. Um, well, it, it, sometimes it just takes that kind of a kick in the ass, you know. I feel like I read somewhere that you, am I crazy that you had another singer and they left and you were just like, all right, I guess I'll try it out. Something like that. It was actually the bass player who told me, why don't you sing? You write all the melodies anyway. But I, I was like, oh, God. And it was like, honestly, like four, four, I don't, two, okay. So two to four weeks before the first album recording. That's when he quit. Oh. And he probably didn't quit. I, pr I think he also probably told us, I won't be doing the album. But we didn't. Uh, well, of course, he will be doing an album. I mean, this is in 96, right? So everybody wants to do an album but yeah no so he quit so so my then wife uh, taught me something i guess and then and, and then i stood in there and when, at that time you also recorded onto you know tape right so you had to sing like the whole thing right <laughs> so, yeah so damn yeah Trial i fainted after fire. each verse <laughs> well i think that's amazing and i think it's worked out pretty well uh for you because here you are here I am, still singing. You know, not only does it, it does, is your voice amazing. I love listening to you sing, but it's also you, it's also very unique. It's, I think especially in metal, and I think I think the thing that you do is something that metal needs more of. Honestly, like um, I I don't hear that kind of inflection and feeling in a lot of in a lot of metal singers. Here you hear a lot of Thank a you lot so much. a lot of uh, too much power, which you've got a lot of power but it's so um i don't know refined and like uh I, I, fuck I, anyway i'm i'm not going to um <laughs> i'm not going to gush too much but that to me is like <laughs> it's i think you've hit that unique and great and super uh like stylistically you um Sounds like things that I've heard before, but not you don't sound like anybody else, if that makes any sense. And, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. That's very kind of you, actually. Thank you. And I I think that a lot of people want to try to sound like someone else. And I think that's a great place to start as long as you yeah. then take it to some place like you have where it's it's just you with but I think I think it's so but, yeah, exactly. And I think that's what that's where you hit the right thing there. There are singers that you can hear that have a great voice, but it doesn't sound like their voice. You know what I'm saying? So you listen to them. It's like, and then they talk maybe. Or you're, it's like, oh, what the hell? You added a persona, which is fine, I guess. I don't know. But I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how to sing high pitched. I don't know how to do growls. I don't know. how. I, I, this is how I sound. And uh, and uh, I'm happy with how I sound. And, and uh, yeah, that's it, basically. Well, also, if you can sing like... A bunch of other people it it probably would be hard to decide when as you're writing a song like oh how am i gonna you know if 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 i could sing like justin bieber and uh uh cannibal corpse and you know uh, like a hundred other people then i sit down to write a song and i'm like what's my identity what's the identity of the band or whatever you sit yeah. down you know what your voice is you've been doing it for 25 years you know what the song's gonna sound like when you sing it yeah that's yeah. i think that's cooler really <laughs> it is but it's also I, I mean i wouldn't say that i did know that when i was back in the you know for first or second or third as i said like fifth album i was still extremely insecure about but that doesn't mean that you can make great things you can still write music is still i think music making and uh, songwriting for me is still that urge of writing the next song it's only about the next song for me uh it's about discovering and rediscovering things within yourself and within music making that that makes me strive and makes me want to do the next chord that's i mean it's amazing that you can be doing something today i'm doing the same thing now that i did was when i was 19 right so it's, it's the exact same thing nothing changed the same dreams same well 
I'm a, I earn a little bit more money right now than <laughs> I did when I was 19. And I, I'm in a better place, uh, you know, feeling great about myself and all of that stuff. But, but uh, in the pure musical sense, where as far as inspiration goes, and I think I still believe that we were going to conquer the world. I still believe that because I've, if I don't believe it, nobody else will believe it, right? So, and then if I put it in a more logical sense, then I, of course, know that we won't be like Metallica. But, you know, I, I, I still want to. And that's why I should keep striving to towards that goal, right? Yes. And I think what you said earlier, too, about, for example, um, having to write certain things. Okay, you got to write something, even if it's not going to be, even if it's not going to wind up on the album or ever get used or ever heard or anything. You have to clear the palette. You have to get it out. You have to get yes. it down and move on. And that, um, and that can be true on a much broader, larger career level as well. Um, you know, there even if it's, you know, your thirteen albums in album fourteen could be your biggest one. Could be the one that matters the most. That even, um, but whether it's the greatest one you ever did or the biggest hit or whatever, or the biggest personally satisfying thing that you've done, yes. you had to get all of the rest of it out to get to that point. And that's just true in life, uh, not to get too philosophical, but you, you mentioned the same thing earlier. Like you, um, you know, you had to do all of that to get where you literally are sitting right now. Like you said, yeah. well, you're making more money than you were when you were 19. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and believing that you could be the next Metallica is extremely important to even yes. getting to even writing the next word. <laughs> yeah, or even if you, your next goal is that you want to buy this or that guitar, or uh, or even you know today at least you can afford to listen to music. Before you had to buy music all the time when I was growing up, right? And that was hard. I want to buy that album so much that I had to work, you know, delivering papers or whatever it was, right? So, but I mean, yes, striving is everything. And I think we have, without exaggeration, 200 song ideas in the computer that we could play to you guys. And you would say, this would be a, this would be a perfectly fine Evergrey song, right? But it's us who have to feel that it's a perfect song. And every time we start a new recording period for a new album, we listen to all of these ideas. So we sit there like, damn, dude, why didn't we record this part? This is fantastic. And then everybody's like, yeah, why didn't we record this part? And then it's like, are we going to use it? And everybody's like, nah. no. <laughs> because music, and this is where we become sort of pop in a sense, because music for us has to be contemporary. We, we write about stuff that portrays how we feel and who we are at that exact moments, which is great. So I have 13 diaries of my life in every album, right? So it's, 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 uh, so when you have something that is two years old, that's how I felt two, two years ago, right? So it doesn't represent me anymore. And for, for, in a band like Evergrey, it means everything to be sincere and, 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 and write about stuff that, that, you know, I talk about human experience a lot, right? And mm -hmm. then I can't be fake myself. I have to be talking about the things that I feel today, right? So. Yeah. Do you have any advice for someone writing their first song or somebody starting out um, who maybe was, has written a little bit here or there? Like any real solid, actionable advice that somebody can take? The first one is go to work. If you feel, if you don't have inspiration, inspiration is not something that you sit in a sofa and wait for and then it comes. It can, but it usually comes when you're working, when you have your tools in your hands, right? That's when your brain starts to sort of, sort of accommodate that sense of, okay, we're going somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, 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 create a vibe for yourself. We did that a lot. We did that for an album called Storm Within. Uh, we had this video screens up on the wall, just showing storms and stormy oceans and same for the Atlantic. But we just watched that over and over again to create this headspace for ourselves uh, that, that, you know, set the tone. Oh, this feels like we're, you know, we, we felt like we were making music to the movie Interstellar, right? And then we went and recorded the music videos 
in Iceland where they recorded the movie Interstellar. So that sort of, and we, of course, I understand we were very lucky to be able to do that, but you know, all of these things that inspire you, find out what inspires you and that can give you that vibe to write for eight, 12, 14 hours that day. And don't write too long is my second uh, advice. Stop after eight, 10 hours, because that will benefit you eight o'clock in the morning next day. All right. So uh, surround yourself with the vibe of what you're going for. The uh... Yeah, whatever it might be. If you want to write like uh, Beach Boy stuff, go to California, right? If you want to write about murder or death, go to Iceland. <laughs> yes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Iceland. It's the best place in the world. But, you know, you got to be, if, go if, if ocean inspires you, go sit by the ocean, right? right? Or, or at least look at the ocean on, on, a, on, a, on your phone something <laughs> uh the guitarist uh, angel vivaldi was writing an album about each song is like a different kind of brain chemical like adrenaline and all that and he completely repainted his apartment a different color as he was writing each one wow. which i think is like pretty over the top but at the same time whatever it takes whatever yeah, it takes I hope you had a small apartment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it was a uh, not not huge but still goddamn. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, want to paint it once. <laughs> no, exactly. But that's commitment. That's also a thing. Committing to something is super important. You can't write a great song half-assed. I mean, of course there are always going to be songs that have been written in the world that are uh, billboard number one is that oh I wrote this in two and a half seconds and I didn't care about it and whatever yeah okay good for you usually that doesn't happen right so you have to put your all into it and by that I mean you can have fun doing that for eight hours and that's your all uh, yeah it doesn't the it one that comes in five seconds doesn't come until you've written 300 that took your soul Probably, <laughs> at least for me. I still haven't got that, you know, number one hit. So, <laughs> But some of them come easier than others, that's yeah, yeah, for sure, sure. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And some, even if you get a, I remember the first vocal line was where I was super happy and I understood that this is something. I wrote a song called Nosferatu and I had this vocal melody call off your angels and, 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 and I was like, dude, did I write that? It's like, I was so happy with myself. It's like, good for me, you know? <laughs> uh, and I knew at the time that it would be a song that would affect the, our audience and me and, you know, so yeah, it's awesome when those things happen. Yeah, but you have to be receptive to them. You, if you, uh, if you aren't in a headspace where you're being creative, they might hit you and you might go like, I don't know, like, or it just, you won't have primed the pump for them, right. for them to come out. That's yeah. what I find anyways. Exactly. I mean, I mean that, that's priming thing that that's it. And that priming can be 10 days of writing shit that won't end up anywhere. But then I know that I'm one day closer to writing that good stuff. Right. So yes, I'm going to write a book of these fucking things based on these <laughs> good, glorious good. Quote me, man. little nuggets <laughs> from Tom England. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, oh, some real good ones today. Um, you talk about doing the work. Um, how how often are you doing that? Um, do, you, do you write every single day? If I'm not on tour, uh, now we've been away doing like these release shows for, for the album uh, this weekend. So I didn't write today. I'm worn out a bit. Uh, but that also that also goes hand in hand with having knowledge about what to do and when, in a sense, to make you, yourself work in the best possible way. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be only doing this. Uh, so I know that if I rest today, I will be there tomorrow and do stuff, you know, so uh, when I'm home, yes, I, 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 we, I write something for something every day, uh, either the video games or Silent Skies or the next Debbie Gray album. And I'm also in a band called Redemption, you know, so, so we also, so this last 18 months, I think I've done six albums and five video games and, and, you know, so it's, <laughs> yeah, Damn. busy do you, days. Do you write at all for other artists who, um, are not yourself? I write a lot of uh, stuff for uh, fans and for 
uh, that want me on their albums. I participate as much as I can. I do charge absolutely, but uh, as you should. The, yeah, but but uh, it's so great because it it gives me so much outside of uh, it's. I mean, it's a symbolic amount of money, but being able to step into somebody else's creative world and you know take part of that and maybe a young mind even i remember this guy from australia he was like 14 years old and his dad paid for me to be on the album and it was so super super what do you call it juvenile and young and uh, eager and all of that stuff uh-huh. you that you don't have yourself but you got to be a part of that step into his world and uh, you know it's like amazing and i tried to make the best out of his vocal ideas or and some people want me to write vocal ideas, you know, and, and yeah. So yeah, I do all kinds of stuff. That's incredibly inspiring and very refreshing to hear. Um, but also a, a great look into the into the reality of being a musician and a, a full time musician of any kind. You you're doing all of this stuff, probably running yourself ragged, but write but writing every day. It's your job. You're going yeah. at it and uh writing for all your different projects and um and being being in demand that's it's got its own set of challenges but that's yeah at the same time at the same time yeah i mean at the same time a carpenter goes to work eight hours per day right so what the hell is different with me yeah I he doesn't maybe... sit on stage in carpet, but you know. <laughs> well, I want. I became a musician so that I wouldn't have to have a real job. I want to work three hours a day, but instead, it, I work from when I wake up until I go to sleep. And I should have been yeah, a dentist. And that, <laughs> yeah, and that's what all of these things give me. You know, all of these different income streams. Mm-hmm. Uh, they give me freedom to do all of the things that I really need to spend time on without sort of ha- having it wear me, myself out. You know. So what, what this album did in comparison to the, all of our other albums was that we had time this time, right? We had time on our hands to do an album. We didn't have to tour and didn't. By didn't, I mean it. And, you know, we, we love to tour, but it's always we're on a time constraint all the time, right? Yeah. We, you have to do this, then you have to travel to this, which is amazing. It's an amazing life to live. But as far as being a musician, I would like to have 48 hours per day, right? Or... 48 uh, months per year <laughs> yep then i could do it like we did now because now we could go up at eight and uh, write like i told you and then i stop writing at five and then i go in and hang with, with my wife and my kids right and, and 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 i get to be a good person in that aspect as well which helps the inspiration which helps all of the music making and uh, if i'm being super egotistic but in a positive sense then that's what's going to bring you guys the best music for me, right? Because I've been the best I can at all times. And, and, uh, but if you compare that to being on tour and coming home and being worn out because you've been traveling for s- such a long time and then takes seven days to sort of get into a normal sense of uh, the world hanging with the, <laughs> hanging with your family, but I mean, spending time with your family, yeah. you want to be top notch, right? Yeah. But, but you, you, I was very seldom that back in the day so that's what that got us this time we we we, so therefore this album came very easily for us a little bit of a blessing in a dark time uh, getting a good getting something out of it even though it was it was rough for us it was the best time ever in terms of musicianship and inspiration uh but now we got two great albums that we have to tour on so we're gonna be away for nine years now (laughs) you're never gonna your wife's never gonna be like what happened we were at so much time and now i've never seen. where are you you? (laughs) no it's it's the opposite i married a rock musician i thought you were gonna be away for like half of the time yeah exactly get get out of here being home an awful lot get the hell out of here (laughs) <laughs> she's sick of you your kids are yes. like dad go out on tour again yeah. mom's going who crazy. are you leave our house right exactly <laughs> that guy who used to come around just sometimes now he's here all the time <laughs> i hope it's me they're talking about <laughs> <laughs> you, really, you really hope so oh geez uh, the plumber guy yeah. the plumber. <laughs> well tom this has been amazing i am um yes it's been great uh so many wonderful little gems and great stories and such a a deep look into the process of how you write songs um we could do this for for another 10 hours but um 
you need to yeah. do th- real you need to do the th- get back to doing the thing and i won't hold you forever so um the new album is out now a heartless portrait the orphean testament yes. oh i said it right <laughs> i was like got oh, it. don't you got fuck it. it up it's it's <laughs> out as of friday there are several great music videos um that you can go check out for the singles um and it's it turned out super great um i've been listening to it a lot and y'all at home stream that shit um go see Evergrey when they come to your country um it's a great it's a great live show and tom is very excited to bring it to you i'm sure <laughs> for, um, for the next coming nine years yes. for the next nine years <laughs> <laughs> this album and the last one go see them play um anything uh anything that you want to add that where people can check out your stuff no, i mean i just want to make sure that people do check it out because if I often get the perception that people have a preconceived idea of what Evergrey is and never heard us, you know, and all this, it's this dark German power metal band, but I mean, (laughs) it's not. Go check out a few songs uh, on video. If you don't like that, you won't like it. It's fine. Move on. Uh, But do us the courtesy, at least, to listen to it. Hashtag make Evergrey the next Metallica. Yes. Do it. There we are. Let me see that hashtag (laughs) in the comments. Make Evergrey Metallica. Help us. <laughs> Save us. <laughs> Save us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my man. Uh, right. It's so nice to talk to you. Hope to see you very soon. Um, if you if you make it out here, too, I'll uh, I'll come say what's up. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. All right, dude. Have a good one. All right. That was glorious i had such a great time talking to tom thank you guys all uh for being here and hanging out um if you're new i do this every week uh if you came here as an evergrey fan i highly suggest that you check out all the other episodes of the podcast you can find them on hsampodcast.com how songs are made is the name of the podcast i Uh, stream it live here but then also uh, for example if you didn't hear the whole thing here live and you prefer an audio podcast this will be an uh, regular old audio podcast uh, very soon and all the past episodes that we've had will be up there as well and this will be in a playlist that you can access on the Gear Gods YouTube channel, this uh, video, along with all the other live stream videos that I've done for the podcast. You can check out merch for the podcast at the link in the description. Um, I love, love doing this. I am so glad that you guys are here to watch it, but I do these for me so that I can learn all this stuff because it fascinates me. And I hope that you guys are getting as much out of it as I am because I'm sitting here like like a giddy little school child wait, like waiting for the knowledge like <laughs> you know what I mean and this is so much fun I get to interview my heroes and get the answers that I'm sure that you guys want to hear too I thought it was cool that uh you guys were asking questions as well I can't you know it's a little bit hard to um get all of your questions in because it's a you know there's a limited amount of time that we've got to do this but be sure to come back next time and if you guys want to talk about this um dis- discuss in the discord you're going to want to join our discord uh later on and thank you all so much huge thanks to the podcast sponsor who is distro kid check out if you make music DistroKid is the best way to get your music onto the internet. It's also crazy, crazy easy, and you can get it for 7% off of your first year with my special code at the link in the description. Huge thanks to Tom and Evergrey and Napalm Records for setting this up. And um, I will see you guys next week. All right? Oh, next week's guest. Uh, today's the 20th. Yeah. Next week, I'm going to have Ro from I Built the Sky on great friend of mine super cool dude uh we're gonna talk all about his new album and so be sure to mash that subscribe button and get hit the little bell so that you'll know for next week when that happens and i'll see you guys real soon all right